Greetings, church family. I'm so glad that we can gather online to worship together again today. I hope that as we go through this time that you are encouraged, that you are blessed, that you're lifted up, and that you have uh, a sense of community through the screen, that, that you understand that we are all together still, that we are still worshiping together, that we are still a church family. Uh, there's a couple of things I want to mention right now. The first thing is, coming up this coming Friday, uh, April 17, at 7 o'clock, there, we will begin a new series of meetings uh, that will happen uh, Friday night, Saturday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday nights. Uh, and so I invite you to be a part of the Hope Awakens experience, this series of meetings where we will be growing together, we will be learning together, we will be uh, sharing together in different ways. And I just invite you to be a part of that. And I'm going to show you a one-minute clip of Pastor John Bradshaw discussing what this is all about, what the purpose of this is, and, and why I think you would be blessed by this experience. I'm John Bradshaw from It Is Written TV, inviting you to join me for Hope Awakens, a global online event starting April 17. There's a lot of questions being asked right now about where this world is headed, and I'm going to share with you solid answers that you can rely on. We're going to find spiritual answers that speak to where we are today, and we're going to find hope and encouragement. You can register for Hope Awakens at HopeAwakens.com. If you thought there was only bad news in the world, I've got good news for you. Join with people from around the globe as we make sense of the moment. In this interactive event, we'll look to the biblical record and find that there are spiritual answers that right now make a lot of sense. Join Hope Awakens starts April 17. Register for this live event at HopeAwakens.com. When it looks like things are falling apart, we're going to come together on a journey of discovery and blessing. Hope Awakens starts Friday, April 17. Register at HopeAwakens.com. So if you want to be a part of this, if this is intriguing to you, if you want to check it out, feel free to go to HopeAwakens.com and register there. You don't have to register in order to watch it. You can go to another source. It is written... TV and, and watch it there. But I encourage you to register. It's just a very limited amount of information they need so they can be in touch with you. And if you do register, if you choose to register, you will you will get more information. You will get more resources. You will, you will have a deeper opportunity, a greater opportunity uh, to learn and to grow together as we as a community uh, partake of this series. I hope that you're willing to do that. I hope you take that step and register so that we together can move forward with all the information information that they that they would like to to give you in your spiritual growth. One significant thing that's happening this coming week is on Thursday evening at 6.30, we will be having an online prayer meeting where we'll get together on Zoom. I'll be sending out a link. We're getting together on Zoom and sharing prayer requests, praying together, sharing praises, and just connecting with each other. And I, I want you to make sure that you check your email this week because I'm going to be sending out a link where you can click and you can download Zoom and you can be a part of this this prayer meeting where we as a church family can uh, lift up our hearts and our minds and our, our desires and our praises to God together. This last Thursday night, a few of us got together and it was a blessing. I hope you can join us this coming Thursday at 6.30 on Zoom. Watch your email for a link. Thank you. Also today, I want to thank you so much for your faithfulness. I know that this is a different time. That things are things are just odd right now. But as you as you continue to lift up the mission of God in your prayers and, and in your own efforts, I, I want to remind you and thank you for your for your faithfulness and your giving as well. It's important that we surrender our finances to the mission of God. That that we support them in the ways that He's asked us to do. And so uh, you can go to EastgateSDA.org. Our church website, eastgatesda.org, and up at the top right of that website, there's a little giving link you can click there, and it'll come up with all the things that we as a local church are supporting here, and uh, worldwide as well. Or you can uh, get the Avidus Giving app, the same thing will show up there on the Avidus Giving app, or you can send your, your support to the church right here at 380 North Tossic Way in Walla Walla. So I invite you to, to partner with the church and continue to be a part of this, this church family as we work together for the mission of God here in Walla Walla and more broadly around the world. My prayer today is that you are blessed. That is my hope. 
And today we have a number of things that we'll be enjoying together. We've, we've got some music from one of our praise teams. Uh, we have a children's story, and we have a time in the Word of God on this Easter Sabbath. What a blessing it is to gather on Easter. And though, though we can't be together personally, we can still be thankful and grateful and rejoice in the fact that Jesus died for, his, for us. He, he rested in the tomb over the Sabbath, and he rose for us on the first day of the week. What a blessing it is that we can reflect on that this weekend. So as we spend time in the Word, in the context of Psalm 23, you'll see the connection point there that we can make between Easter and Psalm 23. I hope and I pray that you are encouraged, that you're blessed, that you're inspired, and that you can follow Jesus even more closely this coming week because of our time together today. As we begin, I'd like to pray with you. Please bow your heads. Lord, as we spend this time together, I pray that you'd come into our hearts, into our minds, that, that you would tie us together, knit us together as a church community, and that we'd, we would be completely and totally yours. We thank you so much for the blessings of your presence, of your love, of your grace, and of this family that is still one in you. Amen. <music>
sad with you guys. Today, I'm going to share with you a story that took place many years ago, one summer, as we were coming back from a road trip in our camper, pulling behind a pickup truck in North Dakota. We were out on the flats of, I believe it was by Jamestown, North Dakota, when out of nowhere we heard a clunk, 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 and it poosh, and just like that, the camper started pulling really weird. So we pull over to the side of the road, and my dad and mom jump out, and us three little kids, Paul, Shelly, and me, we jump out of the truck, and we go back to look at the camper. And here, one of the tires had blown out and ripped out the inside of the camper. But what really happened was the shackle that was around the axle had broken. And the axle had been pushed back and down, and it messed with the tire, and it blew and pulled out the inside of the camper. It was a horrible mess, and we were stranded way out there in eastern North Dakota, and we lived on the western side. So we had nowhere to go, we had no one to call, and we were stuck. So my dad looked at my mom and he said, you better start praying. So she did. And as we're looking around, we see a shop not too far down the road from where we were. And we thought, oh man, if we could only get to that shop, that'd be amazing. But we didn't know the owners, they were nowhere in sight. Just a few minutes later, a pickup truck pulled up behind us. And the guy said, oh my goodness, do you guys need some help? We said, yeah, we really could use some help and, <laughs> and a welder. And he said, oh, well, my shop is just right over there. And you guys are welcome to use it. If we could get you over there, I think we could limp your camper to it. We said, the guy who welds for me, he's out of town right now. He's not here. So we said, that's the one you really need. <laughs> not three minutes later, another pickup rolls up right behind the boss man. And it's his welder. And he says, I can weld that up for you guys. So we limp the camper right over to that shop. The welder gets out. He puts that shackle back on, patch welds it, lifts our axle back up so that shackle holds. We get the spare tire put on, and we start limping for home. And you know what? It was an absolute miracle. It wasn't even 25 minutes. We were on the side of the road before the boss came along, who let us use his shop, and his welder came along, who fixed our our axle for us. So you guys, whenever you're wondering, does God hear my prayers? Does he see me where I am? The answer is yes. He really does. And he sends help as soon as you need it. Thank you guys. I'll see you soon.
as we turn our attention now to the Word, I'd like to bow our heads together and pray and invite the Lord to be with us as we study His Word. Lord, I thank you so much for this blessing of Scripture, uh, of this psalm, Psalm 23, that so beautifully describes your care for us. Lord, I pray that as we read through this together that you'd come and that you would open our hearts and our minds to your leading. Help us to understand the depth of your love for us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Today we're continuing with Psalm 23, as you already know, and we're gonna okay, first we're gonna read through where we've been so far. If you'll open up your Bible to Psalm 23, or I'll have it in the screen as well. Psalm 23, starting with verse one: "The Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His." namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Sounds like a very unpleasant experience. In order to understand this phrase, we have to go back to the original context. Remember, David is writing as a shepherd. In the Judean countryside, there were plenty of opportunities for disaster. In fact, when David talks to Saul about his ability to fight Goliath, he recounts how he has already fought off bears and lions in order to protect his sheep. I'm sure as David wrote this, that in his mind he saw a setting or two where as he would lead his sheep or goats, he was always on the lookout for these, these predators. He kept a closer watch in those areas and those valleys where he knew that these lions were more likely to ambush prey there. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We all encounter these valleys in our lives. If you haven't yet, you will. A situation where all hope, humanly speaking, is gone. Where there's nothing left, where the bank account is empty, the pantry is bare, the doctors don't have answers, and no one, no one seems to care. The valley of the shadow of death. Can, it can seem like a pretty lonely place. It can seem as though there's no light at the end of the tunnel, that this valley that you're in is just all shadows. But David doesn't stop there. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he says, I will fear no evil. I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. The sheep have nothing to fear if the shepherd is with them. That was true of David's sheep and David's goats. And that's true of us as well. Remember, David is speaking about us as God's sheep. He's not talking about us being the shepherd. We are the sheep of the true shepherd. In Matthew chapter 28, right at the end, the last verse of the book of Matthew, as Jesus gives us this great commission, he says, And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I am with you always. I will not fear, for you are with me, David says. He is with us. In the darkest valley, in the midst of illness, in the midst of temptation, in the midst of suffering and loneliness, when the way forward is unclear and hidden, he is with us. He's with us. 
He said he'd never leave us. He'd never abandon us. He'd be with us to the end of the age. He is with us. But not only is he with us, he understands what we're feeling. And he knows what we're experiencing. He's been there. The writer of Hebrews said this in chapter 4, verse 15. He said this, This high priest of ours, Jesus, understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. We are not alone in this. Your creator, the God of the universe, became one of us and lived as a limited human being. He knows what it's like to have need, to have uncertainty, to be hungry, cold, and tempted. He knows what it's like to have nothing left to cling to but the Father. He knows what it's like to have no comfort but the Spirit. But Jesus' valley experience doesn't end there. Nearly 2,000 years ago in ancient Jerusalem, Jesus entered the valley of of the shadow of death. As the Passover meal ended, Jesus and his disciples left the city and traveled just outside to the, to the Mount of Olives. There, Jesus began to pray. He knew from prophecy and from the, the, the leading of the Spirit that, that his time had come. And so he prayed, as we all should. He prayed several times, and he invited his disciples to pray with him, but they were tired, and they, they fell asleep. But something significant seems to have happened as Jesus prayed there in the garden, because as he prayed, something settled on him that he had never experienced before. He felt heavy. He felt sorrow. And I believe that he began to feel the weight of the world on his shoulders. You know how you feel when you do something wrong? When you do something you know you weren't supposed to do that damaged someone else or a relationship with someone else or that damaged your relationship with God? You know that heavy feeling that brings a lump into your throat and anxiety to your chest? That shame? Jesus had never felt that before. He'd never experienced that before because he had always been faithful to the Father. He'd always kept the covenant. But as he entered this garden and, and went into this time of prayer, it seems as though the weight of the world, the world's sins, began to settle on him so that all of my sin and all the guilt associated with it and all of your sin and all the guilt associated with that and, and all the sin and guilt of everyone who has ever lived and ever will live, all of that guilt and sin was placed on him, the only sinless human being that has ever existed. He was the second Adam, the one who, who was the only pure one who, who, who had come to this world to reclaim this this race for, for himself. And he was taking all of humanity's sins as our representative on himself to carry it to the cross. In fact, it seems as though it was such a stressful, emotional, heartbreaking experience that Luke, Luke describes it as, as it actually had physical manifestation that the stress caused capillaries in his face to burst and, and he began to drip blood down his face. Luke chapter 22. Jesus was arrested that night there in the, in the garden, and he was taken to a trial, a sham trial, that, that was designed simply to, to get him to the cross. Eventually, he was hauled out of Jerusalem, and he traveled that road out of the city to Golgotha. And there, between two thieves, Jesus was nailed to a cross for a crime he didn't deserve to die for simply claiming to be the Messiah. He was beaten. He was abused. A crown of thorns 
maybe kind of like this one, was pressed down on his head. He was whipped till his back was raw. But all of that, though painful and excruciating, was probably nothing compared to the weight of the sin that he was carrying on him. And as he hung on that cross, some of the last words out of his mouth were, It is finished. It is finished. And he bowed his head and he died. Previously in John 10, John records Jesus saying this, verses 14 and 15, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. The shepherd, Jesus, didn't just stand aside watching his sheep go through these dark valleys alone. No, he, he came to this world, he lived as one of us, and he died the death that we deserve, giving us the life that he deserves. And as he did so, he defeated death itself. As Jesus felt the veil of death approaching, he cried out, It is finished! The plan of salvation that began when Adam and Eve abandoned God in the garden, the rescue, the, the plan to rescue them and us from the natural result of sin, that plan had now found its climax on a Roman cross on a hill far, far away. But Jesus wasn't done yet. I appreciate what many preachers have said. It's Friday. But Sunday's coming. Jesus was placed in a borrowed tomb, and there he rested over the Sabbath. And as the sun faded at the end of that Sabbath day, something changed in the universe. Angels dispatched from the throne of God flashed to, the earth, to earth at the speed of thought. They rolled back the stone to reveal Jesus. Not a dead body. Not one wrapped in burial clothes, but the risen Savior, the Savior of the world, the soon-to-be-crowned King, the firstborn of creation, the hope of the world, the, the one in whom we put our trust. Jesus had traveled through the valley of the shadow of death and emerged triumphant. And because he did, we can say with David, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. With Jesus as your shepherd, you have nothing to fear. There is nothing that this world can do to you that can take away what Jesus has done for you. The valley of the shadow of death no longer holds power over us who are in him. Three and a half years ago, our, our middle child, Juliana, was diagnosed with inoperable, incurable cancer. This was hard, and it began our, and especially her, journey through the valley of the shadow of death. One night, as Stacy, Juliana, and I we're talking at the end of the day. Juliana said something significant. Maybe you've heard me say this before, but it's worth saying again. She was talking with us. We were, we were discussing life and death and cancer, and she said, I'm not afraid to die because I know Jesus has me. Juliana was living out 
that experience that David talked about so long ago. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And you can have that same comfort. You can have Jesus as your shepherd too. You can be held securely in the arms of Jesus so that no matter what happens, no matter what dark valley you walk through, you will fear no evil, for he is with you. Through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave, he has defeated this world, the ruler of this world, and death itself. There is nothing this world can do to you that can take away what Christ has done for you. Please pray with me. Lord, I pray that you would come into our hearts, that you'd be our master, our, our shepherd, and that you would walk through us through all of the ups and downs, through the valley of the shadow of death. Lord, I pray a blessing on this church family as they go through this coming week. Lord, may they live, may they live as a part of your flock, as a part of your family. And Lord, I pray that you would watch over them and keep them safe, keep them close to you. Lord, bless us as we move toward this series starting this coming Friday evening. And Lord, I pray that, that, your, that your Holy Spirit would, would draw us closer and many others closer to you through it. We love you. We're looking forward to seeing you. Amen.